There's this myth that the rugged individualist should be the idol of our age. That a pair of bootstraps and self-determination are all a person needs. But there's another way to view the world. As John Donne said, no man is an island, and I believe we're meant to be connected. This series is my attempt to showcase the people I know and love who are building communities with creativity and passion. People from around the country who are working on building a stronger bond between people. I want to show that we don't arrive at the beloved community through grand actions or sweeping legislation, but through the daily commitment to positive action by the people around us. So this might sound a little strange, but I think that different parts of the country make you walk in a different way. If you live in the South, you might walk a little more slowly uh, with a languid pace that lets you say hello to everybody you pass. But me, growing up in the Northeast, I tend to walk like a lot of people, head tucked down, barreling through from door to door so I'm not outside for too long. Uh, I'm definitely not ever saying hello to anybody because that takes energy and it's cold out. But for Chris Steinkamp, even the cold, harsh winters of New Hampshire weren't enough to shake his purposeful, deliberate steps. When I think back to my time at City Air, I see my team leader, Chris, walking the halls of Seabrook Middle School calmly amidst the chaos of all the students running around him. He was a role model, not only for proper hallway etiquette, but also for the self-confidence that all people should have um, when they're in situations, any situation. Um, to be able to walk as if you belong. And Chris belonged in that community. Uh, he served for two years in Seabrook and that town was a part of him. And he took that part of him when he left New Hampshire for Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And in Milwaukee, Chris helped to found the new city or site there and began building a new life for himself and his now wife, Angela. I was there for their wedding uh, and I remember the night before, we were all downtown, standing on the banks of the river. And I remember watching the water flow and thinking about how hard it is to get back upstream. You know, it's uh, sometimes too hard to fight the current. But life's not about going back. It's about going forward and knowing that the people that you meet, uh, you're going to meet them again down the way. And uh, they may be a little different, but they're all part of that current. And that's a pretty cool thing. I'm excited to be finally sharing this episode with you. Uh, interviewed Chris about a year ago, and uh, yeah, I'm just grateful that Chris is still a part of my life. Uh, he has some really interesting stories in this episode from his childhood in Arkansas and growing up in Colorado and his experience with service and now in Milwaukee, a city that he loves, uh, absolutely adores. So uh, I'm excited to share this episode with you. I hope you enjoy this episode uh, with Chris Steinkamp. Well, I was born in Colorado, um, in Longmont, Colorado. And from what I've been told, I lived there two or three years. And then my dad got a teaching job at the University of Arkansas. And um, we moved to Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, that's really like a majority of my childhood. That's elementary school, middle school, a little bit of like preschool. Um, but we were down there for about 13 years. It's cool to be able to like hang around a college campus when you're like in fifth grade and sixth grade and every now and again I'd go to his office with him and they had computers there like this was before like I really had access to a computer so they had computers and the internet and so every now and again he would like go to work on a Saturday and I would go in with him just to like search things on the internet and I would like keep this huge list of things that I was curious about just so those Saturdays when I go in I can just like use AOL.com or AltaVista or whatever it was to like search for things that I was interested in. Um, but we also went to like a ton of football games and I, don't know, I feel like there's just like other events and like 
presentations and stuff that it was cool to be around a college campus. I mean, I do remember the college campus being like really well taken care of and like the kind of the gem of the, the town that we lived in. But I think I was too young to like honestly know a whole lot about like societal divisions at that point in my life. Um, but by the time we moved back to Colorado, it was like very clear that there was like a, you know, the areas of the city where the college campus money benefited was very, very compact into like a certain area of the city. And then everything around that was, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of like fending for themselves. You know, and I lived in a town where the, the college campus was kind of the money source. And so 10 months out of the year, it was like a really thriving spot. And then those other three months, it was kind of like weird and, you know, nobody really knew what was going on. And yeah, so I grew up like pretty well off. Like my parents didn't want for much. We like never really struggled that much with like, you know, anything. We took vacation like every year. Um, and a majority of like the people around me were in that similar kind of scenario. Uh, and I think it's like partially like Arkansas is a really affordable place to live. And so if you have a steady job, it's like it's pretty easy to feel like you're well off in Arkansas. But as soon as we moved to Colorado, I like quickly understood that Colorado was just a much more affluent place on the whole. And to be considered like someone who, who is well off it was much, it was like a much more divided segment of society, you know? Like even now looking, looking back on a, a lot of friends that I had in Arkansas that I would have considered well off within like the scope of Arkansas would be like way below the poverty line in Colorado just because like property values and taxes and all of that is just so much higher in a state like that. For a majority of the time I was in Arkansas, I was like a little young naive kid just like riding my bike around town and like playing in the mud and so I didn't like pick up on all these things but every time I've gone back to visit Colorado since then it's like it's really clear that it's an intensely um, conservative state you know but I would have never known as like a 10 year old riding my bike you know. My mom didn't work so she stayed at home which was really awesome she was really involved with parent teacher organization and she was like the craft lady at school so whenever there was like a field day or like anything where moms organized something she was like the mom to like come in and do like holiday crafts with us or like bake sales or anything which was really cool but it was also like it produced a lot of those moments where I'm like mom uh, but it was it was super cool because it did you know, looking back on it, it did make the whole family just more connected to our schools. Um, and I was, it was also really interesting having like m me and my brother's age space like the way it was because it meant that I would spend one or two years of school with one of my brothers before he moved to another school and then I'd have like a year or two where I'm the only Steinkamp at the school and then I'd go to the next school that he's at and then you know, so in a way I was kind of like always like following the things that he had like, the impressions he had made on people. Um, but being a little brother was interesting. I can easily pick out the moments in my life where I was like, I really needed attention and really just like wanted to be a part of something. I saw my brother, he would play soccer. He was like on a, a soccer club. So I'd see him play soccer. And I'm sure that in some way like rubbed off on me and made me want to play soccer. And then so for, you know, six years I was in a soccer club. Um, yeah, we also did some things like as a family, like uh, we set up, I mean, I didn't have any part of this I was since I was so little, but my parents were really, um, I'd say like really dedicated to like setting up rituals for our family. Um, so, I mean, I think the standard ritual for families is like eating dinner together, but we would like every Sunday, my dad would take all three of us and we'd go play tennis like really early in the morning, which at the time I fought a lot. You know, I was just a little kid. I like wanted to sleep. I didn't want to wake up at 5.30 a.m. and go like run around and hit a ball. Um, but like looking back on it, those were like some really awesome times. Just like be with my brothers and my dad when the sun was rising, like playing tennis, nobody else is around. Um, and then often my mom would come join us at a park is like pretty close to our house. She'd come join us. We'd all like cook breakfast in the park and have these big like Sunday rituals, which is cool as I think about like different religions and like really diving into a few. I didn't grow up with religious rituals. And when I think about it, those like Sunday morning rituals, like playing tennis, like eating breakfast as like a huge family was like a really, really awesome ritual to have. So I played soccer. I played basketball. 
Um, and then I played tennis, but I only played soccer and basketball uh, on like a school team. Um, I played tennis just with my family and never really wanted to play like competitive tennis. It was kind of like a, uh, of another push and pull situation for me. I feel like a lot of situations in my life are like push and pull situations, but I was, I was a portly kid. I was a little, I had a little junk in the trunk. And so I liked the team aspect of sports, but I didn't really like running a whole lot. And so unfortunately I played the two sports where you have to sprint all the time, basketball and soccer. So, um, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I didn't feel like I was very good at the sport because I was like a husky kid and I like couldn't move really quick, but I really liked accomplishing something with a group of people together. And so I would like try to find my niche on the team that I could do well without like running a whole lot so I was you know I played like the post the center basketball and I played like goalie for soccer and what didn't have to run at all um, so I feel like you know minimizing the things that I don't want to do while still being a part of this community of like these people who played sports was was like the way I kind of approached it and you know doing that I got really great at being a goalie and I got really great at like blocking people out in basketball so you kind of like I don't know I developed those those skills just from, I don't know, almost from a, a desire to not have to be uncomfortable and feel like I wasn't doing something well. Um, but it was also really interesting to like play sports with people on the weekend and then see them in school as well. So I don't feel, uh, let me say I don't, I'm not going to say I don't feel, I was not a very popular kid in school and a lot of the people who were like on those teams, at least the basketball team with me, were like the popular kids. And so it was interesting because like on the weekends, it was like a team effort and I was like on level playing field with people. But then, you know, you're in seventh grade, you go back to school and like everything is divided by like social cliques and popularity and, and that kind of stuff. And then, you know, at school, I didn't feel like I was like in the same league as those people anymore. And I'm sure a lot of that was me putting that on myself, but I'm sure there was like some some social feedback giving me that as well. So it was always really interesting because the weekends I felt like very cohesive, um, but school was, man, school is a totally different topic. We could talk on that for a while, especially in middle school. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I stopped playing basketball and soccer when I was in eighth grade and really just kind of focused on playing tennis and like developing more cognitive based skills. I was really good at, <laughs> I was gonna say, I was really good at school. Um, I don't actually know what that means though. I knew how to, to like get through the system on top is what I feel like I knew from school. Like I knew how to study to be able to like do well on the tests. Um, but I didn't really like gain a whole lot of like factual knowledge from that studying. So one of the things I was thinking about is like when I stopped playing sports on the weekends, I started like learning a lot about like I started reading for my own fun and like just like learning about other things and those are the experiences I actually feel like informed like the values that I have today um, so school it was always like I was always fairly good at it like I never really felt like I didn't understand something conceptually and I always understood that you know if there's a, a test coming up there's a certain amount of time I need to study for it and there's a certain amount of time I need to like be separate from it for that information to be able to like come out of me at the right time when I'm taking a test. Um, so I feel like from a very young age, probably like sixth grade, fifth grade, I like I understood the formula that public education gets at, which is like facts, study, regurgitate. Um, and I did that really, really well. It was probably like junior year of high school where I started hitting a wall of the amount of knowledge my brain could contain at every, any given time. Calculus or AP Chemistry or one of those where the, the conceptual learning just started like missing my brain. It just started going around me. And that's, that's the time where I started like getting, getting frustrated or getting like a, a, little, a little down about my capacity to learn. Um, which was interesting because before then I always just kind of like I was getting straight A's and I was like doing really really good in school. When I moved from Arkansas to Colorado I moved at the very start of senior year and that was like a pretty tough thing because you like build all these relationships through elementary school and middle school and then I left the place that I was with all my friends you know being a freshman in a high school with no friends I was like I needed to like find new friendships. I think a lot of the friends I surrounded myself with were like convenience friends. Not to say that 
that those friends were bad people, but they're looking back on it, they're not the people I probably would have chose myself to, to surround myself with if I didn't need like that friendship bucket filled. And I think that like had an effect on my motivation to learn or my capacity to learn because I was like probably thinking more about my friendship connection and my social connections than, you know, than my, my studying. At that point, I, I feel like I was starting to like really understand myself. I'm introverted in many ways. So I started like doing a lot of things on my own. And so like high school was the time where I would like, I would go camping for like a weekend on my own, like go fishing and like I was fine with that. And I, I also started to realize at that point, like how not, no, well, I don't wanna say not normal, but like most people, if they wanna like go camping, they're gonna like find a friend or two to like go with them. And like I, at that point, I was just like, you know, I just wanna like go out there by myself and like have time to think, I'll bring a book and like maybe I'll like take a nap. And like that was recharging to me and like life-giving to me. Um, and so it, it was interesting because at the same time, I was like intensely concerned about like friendship connections and like social connections, but I was also finding a lot of um, peace and learning in solitude. Um, and so there, there are again these like push and pull of like I want to be a part of that because I see it and it looks so cool and those people are amazing but I also know that like I need to like not be a part of that in order to like be whole so I can be a part of that. Um, so I feel like the, the you know when I wasn't in school in high school I was I was either like out with people like building friendships or out by myself, just kind of exploring the world and doing whatever. My extracurriculars were um, driven by my own, just like whims. I didn't, I, I was like, I was pretty, um, even though I was a good kid, I was very rebellious, I guess. And almost anything somebody told me to do, I was like, mm, eh, I don't know if I'm gonna do that guy, sorry. So that also could have had a play in my lowering of my academic performance. <laughs> yeah. I knew I was going to college, but I think I only knew that because that was like the option that my like family and people around me were presenting me with. I didn't like really have a clear understanding of what life would be like if I like just got a job right out of high school um, or if I traveled or just did whatever right out of high school. So I feel like I had like blinders on in a certain sense, but I'm glad I, I went. I mean, I was, it was amazing four years. Um, and I knew I wanted to go somewhere in state just because of like the money scenario. So um, yeah, it was between Colorado State University and um, University of Colorado. So I applied to them both, I got into both, um, and I ended up going to the University of Colorado. Um, partly because it was closer, but then also partly because it had just it seemed better in general. You know, I don't exactly know what made me make that decision, but there was just something that was pulling me towards that. And I instantly just loved college. I mean, like, when you're enrolled in the college, you've got all of these resources, like, at your fingertips, you know? Like, even though it's not, like, no one says you can do this, I would just, I would go sit in on, like, anthropology classes because I was interested, and I would sit in, like, mythology classes just to, like, learn about it. I wouldn't do it, like, every week, but, you know, every now and again, I'd, I you know, would just go and like sit in on a class and nobody would question you because you're like a, you know, a kid who looks like you should be in college. And I was in college, I just wasn't enrolled in that class. So I, I loved all the information that was constantly around me. And so I was just, I was learning a whole bunch. I think because the whole world seemed like it was very open at that point, like I could study anything I wanted to, I could ideally build a career on something I'm interested in. That's really when I started to realize like, I am interested in like almost everything. Like the entire world fascinates me and almost everything anybody does is fascinating to me. And it took me like a good year or two of being really torn and being really interested to actually like come to a consensus about like okay I know I can't study everything I can't major in everything like what do I really want to major in um, and that's that's still like kind of what I was saying before about community that's still like a really tough thing to do because like there's so many awesome things happening in the world and there's no way one person can be a part of all of them and so you have to try to figure out what makes you feel most alive what um, what like fits into your your values and like what fits into your lifestyle and then just make the most of those um, but yeah that's that's like a constant struggle so I studied um, I studied 
philosophy and evolutionary biology. Um, ended up leaving philosophy and minoring in evolutionary biology um, and then joining the business school. Um, and then I ended up not getting my minor in evolutionary biology, so I, I graduated with a, a bachelor's in business administration and entrepreneurship, um, which is really, like, it's a very general major, and I think it's been really, like, really helpful um, for me, like, working with people, because I studied a lot of, like, leadership theory, and within that I studied a lot of, like, social theories. Um, but I think a general trend in my life is that I since I do like being involved with so much, it's really hard for me to want to specialize in anything. And that's how I feel like my, my studies were. It's like I never really dove like head first into any one thing because I knew I also wanted to dive into that thing and this thing and that thing. Um, yeah, so, so I don't feel like I'm a, like I have any specialty that I can like really lend to anybody other than my like vastness of experiences that may may to some people seem like very um, surface level you know I feel like most of the things I was involved with I wasn't involved with them because of the activity I was involved with them because of the people who were like around that activity yeah so I like I got involved with rock climbing because one of my roommates was really big into rock climbing I feel like other than that it was it was just like as much as I could like me and my friends would just spend time in the mountains I mean Boulder is right on the edge of the Rocky Mountains. And so it's, you know, within an hour, you can be a few miles up into the mountains. So we would do that a lot. I spend a lot of time like camping. And that's a really awesome way to get to know people when you like spend time away from the normal ebbs and flows of, of a culture. You're almost forced to like get to know each other on a like really intimate level. Um, and I, I feel like that's how I built a lot of friendships over college is like, camping with people getting to know them and their friends like you tell stories about your life and the things that you think about and like the things that you think you care about and the theories you have about the world and all that stuff um, yeah so I think just like a lot of talking and a lot of like hearing different people's perspectives and that was primarily how I spent my my college years I should probably say that when we moved back to Colorado we lived in a suburb and living in a suburb for four years like I, it like it, I felt like I had was like an ant. I don't know the suburb we lived in. Like people didn't do things together, and there was no way in which you would know that you're valuable other than like the things you owned. You know, um, and so that was one of the things that like I saw suburbs as like a really dominant factor of like the way people lived in Colorado. And I was like, I don't know, that's not how I want to live my life. So having lived in Boulder, Boulder, Colorado for four years it became like very apparent that it's, it's a very liberal place and it, there's like a lot of ingenuity and like creative thinking happening in that place but it's also it feels like a bubble of like privilege or like there's things that are happening in the world that it feels like they never affect people living in Boulder and for some people and even for myself living there for a while like that was really cool to just like be in a place that seemed like like uh, really serene and like like it seems like if you're living in Boulder and you're doing like great things that like the world is on the up and like things things are beautiful, um, but then I was like I thought about it a lot more and like there's a lot of ways in which like that community in Boulder it's like really affluent um, isn't really benefiting like two communities over the poverty in Denver or Golden or like the people who are living in the rural part of the state and you know it's. I felt like it would be really easy to get sucked into that, that mindset of like, okay, if I graduate, I'll just get a job here and like it's a cool place to live and the mountains are right here and like I don't have to worry about getting robbed. So, um, but eventually I, I just like realized that like, that's not really what I want to do. You know, I'd rather be living and working in a place where like my existence mattered for something. And in Boulder, I was just like another person living in the bubble, you know? And so that's, that's why I joined City Year. I got really interested in national service because I felt like whoever was running the national service show was really in tune with the areas of our country that, that people just needed to be. And so they put me in a place where it was, yeah, it was needed, yeah. There is a lot to be said about feeling value in your existence. And I, f I feel like that's one of the, like, the central pieces of like, feeling like you're a part of a community. You know, it's like you know what your value is. Um, and in Colorado, I couldn't see where my value was. And that's why I knew I just like, needed to leave and like, get some other experiences 
and then like I'd come to something. I actually didn't even apply to City Year. Um, I applied to AmeriCorps and Triple C, and Ted Wing pulled my name out of like the database, and he called me up and told me what it was about, and it sounded pretty cool, and so I applied, and I didn't really know what I had signed up for. To tell you the truth, like when I bought my plane ticket, I was just kind of like, you know what, I'm gonna go out here and do it for a year. I know I can probably move back to Colorado if it doesn't pan out for my life or whatever, but I really was just like looking for a new experience that was gonna like expose me to different things, and hopefully I'd like, you know, lend a hand here and there. Um, yeah, so I had really no idea what I was signing up for. I actually thought that I was gonna be working in Boston because of what little I knew about City Year. So when I, was, when I flew out there, I was thinking like, oh, okay, so I'll live in Seabrook. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work in Boston. Oh, they'll probably like give me a car or something. Like I had no idea, like no idea what I was getting into. Um, but that's exactly what I was looking for. And I think at a certain level, I didn't educate myself about it because I wanted the surprise aspect of it, which is kind of, I know it's really important, I think, in life to, to intentionally not not know what's coming next, you know? Yeah, but the, that transition was interesting. So from college, I spent that whole summer like on a road trip with some friends because they were moving to Portland, Oregon. So it was kind of like our, our like parting trip. So went to Montana, went to Vancouver, and went to Seattle. And then I went to Burning Man for like four days right before I got on a plane to go to New Hampshire. And so I feel like I got to New Hampshire with like all of these experiences I just had from my travels, like still processing them all. Um, and it was, that was actually probably really good because it didn't allow me to have a whole lot of time to like think about what I potentially was leaving in the Colorado community. It was just like one thing after another, just soaking it in. And like, I didn't really have too much of an opportunity to like really, really second guess myself. Um, which is interesting considering the type of person I knew I was, someone who needs like processing time and needs time to just like be on my own and think about things. So I got there and um, immediately just kind of like liked the people that were around. And I also really liked what I saw in New Hampshire. Um, and so I, I got excited about the people and the physical place right off the bat. I loved the fact that I was like living in a house with eight other core members right on the beach. Like I knew there was something really special in that. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it meant like people are gonna get in like fist fights or like what it was, what was gonna happen. But I knew it was really cool to be living in like really close community with people that I just met that seemed really amazing that were all here for like a really similar reason. I'd say my core year was really tough. It was mentally taxing for me to like try to figure out what I can expose kids to that's gonna like improve their life in some way. Since I'm, I'm a fairly introverted person, I had never really like taken a whole lot of time to like really dive into what other people's lives must be like. You know, I think about myself a lot and I know it's like a pretty selfish thing to do, but in a certain way, thinking about myself has also helped me like be a better person for other people because I know my limits and my capabilities. But I'd never really, I'd never worked in a school before or an after school program or with like kids for an extended period of time. Like every now and again, I'd like lead an activity for kids at like, you know, a school thing or whatever, but um, I'd never really had consistent um, interactions with the same group of kids before. And so I had no idea what being like a, a mentor or like a, you know, a mentor was going to be like for, you know, students. Um, and part of it I realized is, is gauging their expectations and trying to figure out how I can not only meet their expectations, but at the same time I can like hopefully introduce something new to their world that might like inspire them to like you know, have an, a door open that they wouldn't have otherwise had open, you know, and not to say that I was like, you know, I think it's, it's more about like, if they, if they had an interaction that was really, really important to them, that would like stick with them for more than just like the time where I was there, like that, that's something that's important to me, regardless of if that interaction was like playing kickball, you know, like there's something really, really special about like a memory that a child will like hold on to in the hopes that it's going to inform a decision later on in their life. Yeah, so I, it was really difficult for me to try to figure out how to be consistent for kids, um, but it was also really, really good. And also to, 
to have to, like I mentioned before, I'm, I wasn't, authority was never something that I was like too, too keen on. Um, and so to, to be in a scenario where I, in, in a certain sense, like was an authoritarian and needed to like follow procedures and like be a part of this greater public school system and reinforce those expectations, that was a difficult thing for me because in a lot of, a lot of scenarios, what I imagined would be beneficial for a student to hear would be like controversial in the scope of like a public school setting. So a lot of times, you know, kids would talk to me about like their home lives or like poverty or, you know, whatever else. And there's like, there's boundaries within what, what a conversation in a public school should be like. Um, and so I felt very conflicted trying to figure out like how can I be a good, good mentor for school? Like how, because I felt like I, I could probably do that if it was just like my neighbor, like if this kid was a neighbor and we were interacting, but um, I also felt very bound by a lot of like policies, both from our organization and from the school. Um, and that was, it was really interesting to navigate, but also I feel like that, that skill, that like knowing, um, like what the boundary is within the, the context and the scope of the environment, that is one of the most important skills in having a job. And I didn't even like realize that before because all my other jobs were like, they were jobs, right? They, I had no, no buy-in into the job. It was like a job for a paycheck. So this was really like the first experience I had where I was started to think about like, oh, well, like there is a right decision here, like a very clearly defined right decision by everything that came before me, and there's an expectation I need to uphold within that decision. Um, so coming to that expectation was challenging, but I think really good. I think my team, my first year in City Year, it wasn't a team that I like felt super connected to. You know, but I, I learned a lot about that, and I learned from my team leader. Um, she told me, because she knew I was gonna be coming back for a second year, so she kind of like talked me through how she was deciding to like make decisions with and for the team. Um, so it was like really good hands-on training into like how to actually manage seven people's desires, wants, and skills. I was excited to be back in that same school because I like formed some really cool um, relationships with students. So I worked in seventh and eighth grade my core year and I was really excited to see some of those seventh graders become eighth graders. One thing I'd also been thinking about is like to make a difference in someone's life, like the consistency, so consistency is needed, but there's a certain amount of longevity that's needed as well. And at that point in my life, like 10 months just didn't seem like enough time to like actually make any sort of like lasting change. I've since changed my, my whole view on that and I think um, the, the magnitude of the person's perception of what's happening is probably the most important thing because there's been a lot of like one-off experiences where I've had that stick with me forever and that have formed a lot of what I believe in. Um, but that was one thing I felt like I needed to be around that community just like a little longer, 10 months longer. Um, but I also, um, on the organizational side, on you know, the city years like structure and culture, I felt like it had done so much in like exposing me to new things and challenging worldviews that I had had. Um, I've seen I'd seen it happen with other core members in my core year, and I at some level wanted to be a part of bringing that to like a whole new group of core members. Um, in my mind, city year was always half about the students and half about the core members like it was very much like an equal split and I know now it's like almost all about the students um, but that was one thing that like really made me want to stick around it's like those two balances of like exposing young people to new experiences and testing them and putting them in the right scenarios so they can have an impact on these students that like that whole strategy got me like excited to come back. That was a really great year. I think that was a year where I was in a role where I felt like I was good at it. You know, I felt like even though I was good at it, I could keep getting better at it. And I really enjoyed the challenge of like trying to motivate people and organize all these different projects that we were working on. But I also didn't realize going into that year how less connected to the students I would be. And so that was, that was tough for me to realize like what level of interaction I could actually have with students that wasn't gonna detract from the, the relationships that you and the other folks on our team were building. Um, 
Yeah, but that was that was cool. It was much more. Um, I would say it was much more administrative than social. What I did that year, which was good. Like I think that was like a really good f experience for me to have. Um, just in the sense that, like, if if you are ever going to lead people, you need to be able to do the social aspect, but you also have to like be organized on the back end and like be able to coordinate everything before the social aspect gets there. Um, so it was, that was really cool. Um, it was also really interesting to learn from you and Sandra and Charlie and Bear and I mean, it was like, yeah, it was just, it was really interesting. Like take, being able to almost sit back a few times and, and watch how things play out in order to think about the next move which in the previous year, you didn't really do that. You're always kind of like doing in order to do the next thing. You didn't really get to sit back and evaluate too much. So after I finished my senior core year, I was interviewing with City Year in Miami, DC, and Milwaukee. And I got a really good sense from the staff that I interviewed here in Milwaukee that this was gonna be like a place of innovation. And it was also like a brand new site. Um, and so again, like f going back to like feeling like I'm contributing to something, I knew as like a founding staff member, my value was going to be marginally higher than if I was just adding on to a staff that had been in existence for 15 years or whatever. Um, so that was really attractive to me, but I also knew I've got an aunt and an uncle that live here in Milwaukee, an aunt and uncle live in Madison, and then an aunt and an uncle and a bunch of cousins that live in Rockford, Illinois. So I knew like being closer to my family community was something I was really interested in. I hadn't previously been super connected with like extended relatives, and this what I felt like was my opportunity to really start that phase of my life and like really get involved with my, my grandpa and my aunt and uncle and like develop a relationship that, with them that was more than just like aunt and uncle and nephew, you know, like I felt there could be so much more there. So that was also a big motivator for me to make that decision. And so we moved out here at the end of the summer of 2010. Um, Angela stayed in New Hampshire to finish up her job and I was living here um, solo for a little bit, but then she moved out here. Um, and it was, it was interesting. This is the first city I've lived in, but the first day that I moved here, like the very first day, I started work at City or Milwaukee. And so all the people that I knew for like probably a good six, seven months were City or people or people in education, which was great because that network can, tends to bring in some really, really special intuitive and like good people. Um, and so that really helped me get established in Milwaukee. My first impression of Milwaukee was how hardworking everybody is. What I've learned so far is that that's a general characteristic of Midwestern cities, is like there's just this work ethic, like people really just want to be working, which makes me think a lot about if people want to be working, that's, I think they just want to be involved in like something cool, you know? They want to know what their value is. But then the second thing I noticed is like how clearly divided the city is in many ways between affluent communities and non-affluent communities and the places where there's high crime places where the police are trolling a lot and like the rundown areas of the city like there's very very clear lines then I talked to a lot of people about why that could be and I mean there's there's some historical events that have happened that make those lines so clear but then there's also I think this city is um, a very traditional city in in terms of like the cultures that um, that founded the city and have lived here and they've tried to retain a lot of their their traditions. In the city you'll notice from this block to this block it's very very Polish and then from this block to this block it's very Hmong and then from this block to this block it's very African-American. What I think about a lot is like when cultures try to retain their traditions they want to retain them in like a, a pure form. You know like people aren't very excited about blending their cultural traditions with other cultural traditions because if you do that that no longer is a Polish tradition, it's now a Polish Hmong tradition, and it's something very new. But I mean, that's something that our country was founded on, but communities still want to retain the old like traditions that they have. In some sense, it's beautiful because it's like building this community within itself, 
but in some sense it's also alienating other people who don't feel like they have a traditional history and there's not a lot of places for them to fit in. Which it seems like the, um, the communities in poverty are a lot of people who for you know this event or that event don't have a lot of um, cultural history that they can offer the city or that they can build their own community within. Um, and so, yeah, the city seems very divided in that way. But within that, if you like look inside those like those um, communities, some really beautiful stuff happening. It just rarely escapes that community. Let me tell you about this neighborhood because yeah. this neighborhood's really really special to me too. This is River West, and it's kind of known as like one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the city. Could partially because it's on like where it is geographically is right at the like the um, the margin between uh, the affluent community on the lake and the inner city population and the downtown population. And so um, this neighborhood has like almost every like race of the city represented, um, but also has like a lot of college students. It's got a really good mix of renters and owners. Um, and so with all these like populations, it, it's a, like a very innovative place to be, but it's also a pretty easy place to like find things to be involved with that you care about because of all those different people. So pretty much immediately after moving here, started getting involved with a few nonprofits. Um, the organization I now work for, which is right across the river, um, I started volunteering there. We were members. The food pantry that, that I volunteer with is right down the street. And I feel like this neighborhood is one of the places in Milwaukee that if you grow up here, what I've seen is that people grow up here feel a really special connection to this neighborhood and they don't want to like move away from Milwaukee or this neighborhood, which is, it's pretty cool to see that as an outsider because I have moved away from the places I've grown up at, but um, I am starting to feel like very connected to the culture of this neighborhood. One of the, my favorite things about this, this neighborhood is the video store, like an actual video store, like a block away. I can like walk down there, give the man a dollar, take a video and come home and watch it. And I can talk to him too, it's amazing. <laughs> it feels like there's this like momentum that this city has that is small enough that I feel like I have some influence over how things are like in my community, how things play out, but big enough to still like offer a lot of really novel opportunities to people, things that people work on here tend to be things that they work on for their own passions. And I think that there's something really special in that and just being able to like have a place where people feel comfortable and welcome working on their own passions. Um, but then we also have a, a city that like, I feel like Milwaukee is really good at telling Milwaukeeans about what's happening in the city. I don't think we do a great job at like national PR. Like there's some stuff that's like happening um, like in Seattle that we've been doing in Milwaukee for like 10 years but since we're not good at like putting ourselves on national news like nobody knows about that but people in Milwaukee know about it. There's something in the city that almost everybody can identify with um, and that's really really special to people. Um, and I also feel like there's a very strong cohort of people who are like lifelong Milwaukee advocates and I don't think I'm at that level yet because I've only been here a few years but like there's some people who are that I know they're like 25 and they could easily like build a career somewhere else but they're like they're like nope I'm staying in Milwaukee this is a really cool place to be and I want to see what happens you know any community that most people are involved with there's also a benefit for that person to be involved with that community like I feel like when I joined up with City Year my thought was I'm going to give as much as I can and like that's what I'm in this for and that's what my view of like community service was, was like trying to figure out how much of myself I can like give away. But I've come to understand that like a community is not my community unless I'm also benefiting from it. An example is the, the food pantry. Like I'm not a client of the food pantry. I don't go there to get um, food, but I know that there's, you know, the 10,000 people that they feed, they live up the street and over there. And like, I understand that like the work I do with this food pantry makes this neighborhood more stable less crime, less desperation, and like that's good for me living here. Um, yeah, and so to, to understand my benefit from my involvement in something, um, it's like that's not what fuels my decision to be a part of a community, but 
that's what makes something like a sustainable commitment for me, you know? I've been recently thinking a lot about how everything in my life like fits together and trying to figure out how to not segment the different communities I'm a part of, um, which is very complicated to do, but I think it's also like for me to be, to feel like a whole person, it's really tough for me to think of like some of my time going over here and having no connection at all to the, where my, the rest of my time goes to. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about how the work I do benefits the community I live in and the people I care about. Um, and I, I don't have any like profound understanding of all that, but knowing that the people that profit from the work I do aren't people who don't live in Milwaukee. Like everything I feel like, everything I'm doing, the, the people who benefit from it are Milwaukeeans, you know? Like I, that's part of why I like working for a small business and for a nonprofit is because I know where like the money trail is going and it's not going to someone who lives in like the Bahamas with like a bank account in Deutschland, you know, like there's, there's something really special about knowing that the, the people who benefit from my existence are people who can benefit me as well. <laughs>